Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Tony Joe Henry, born Annie Beatrice McQuiston, was born on January 3, 1916 in Louisiana. She was number three of five children, and they all initially lived with both parents. Unfortunately, in 1922, her mother became ill with tuberculosis and passed away, so Tony left to go live with her grandmother. Although she wanted to continue living with her grandmother, her father quickly remarried and requested that Tony come back home to live with him and his new wife. She was never truly happy living with them, and at the age of 13, she got her first job working at a macaroni factory. She did not have the job for long because her boss fired her after finding out she had a family history of tuberculosis and he believed it to be contagious. Her father was extremely upset with her losing her job and not being able to assist with the family's living expenses, so Tony ended up running away. As she got older, she found refuge working as a prostitute in a brothel and became addicted to cocaine. Although cocaine was her drug of choice, she frequently drank and smoked weed as well. Throughout the years, she was arrested multiple times for her work or for getting into scuffles with men, but she never stayed in jail for long. When Tony was 23 years old, she met a John at her brothel by the name of Claude Cowboy Henry in Austin, Texas. Claude was a career criminal and a prize fighter who immediately fell in love with Tony's beauty. The two hit it off and for the first time in her life, Tony felt as if she found a man who would respect her and treat her right. In Tony's own words, she said, he gave me a home and he got that drug monkey off my back and that drug monkey is a big strong thing. I remember the day I told him I was a cokey and the look on his face. He thought I just smoked marijuana and grinned. But when I told him my train went a lot further than marijuana, he took me to a hotel room and I lay there in bed for a week and he would come in now and then and ask me how I was doing. He would slap my face with a cold towel and we would both laugh. Infatuation turned into love and the two agreed to marry. Before officially tying the knot, Claude went to a bar in San Antonio, Texas. He was drunk, got into an argument, and being the prize fighter he was, who did not back down from a fight, ended up getting into a bar fight. He won, leaving his opponent unconscious and left thinking nothing of it. Soon after, he and Tony decided to get married on November 25, 1939, and the wedding was within a year of them meeting. After marrying, the two drove to California to enjoy their honeymoon. Upon returning to Texas after their honeymoon, Claude was arrested and charged with murder. Unbeknownst to him, the bar fight he got into before his wedding left a man by the name of Arthur Sinclair dead. Arthur was an off-duty police officer, and when trial began, the only reason why the death penalty was off the table for Claude was because Arthur was off-duty at the time of the fight, and Claude was unaware of Arthur's profession. Tony was in court every day supporting her husband, and when he received his 50-year sentence, she became hysterical in court and yelled that she would get him out. Tony later went on record and said that she had never suffered more in her life than when Claude was sentenced and sent to the Texas State Prison in Huntsville, Texas. Tony was serious when she screamed that she was going to get him out of prison and quickly started devising a plan because she needed money and someone to help her. Because of her work, she knew many career criminals and she reached out to an old friend who was infatuated with her and would do anything for her. Harold Finnan Arkey Burke. Arkey was an army deserter turned drifter and even though he knew he enlisted to help break Tony's husband out of prison and there was no chance of them being together, he was happy to be by her side. Tony was living in Beaumont, Texas at the time, so she and Arkey robbed a local hardware store close by and they were able to steal 16 guns. 
They were driving towards Arkansas and committed multiple robberies along the way. They both split the money and Tony was getting closer to reaching her goal. They wanted to do one last big hit, which was robbing a bank in Stuggard, Arkansas, and before doing so, they agreed to steal a car that would be used for their getaway car. It was Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1940. Tony and Arky were now in Lake Charles, Louisiana, ready to steal their getaway car. They were both hiding behind a bush near the shoulder of the highway, waiting for the perfect opportunity. Mind you, during this time, temperatures were low, lakes were frozen over, and there was even snow in certain areas. Tony then came out and stuck out her thumb, pretending to be a hitchhiker. She was dolled up with her long black hair, waiting in the cold, and a man by the name of Joseph P. Calloway quickly spotted her and pulled over to help the woman in distress. He was a salesman and was driving a car he was delivering, which was a Ford Coupe, all the way back to his hometown of Houston, Texas. When he pulled over, Arky came out of the brush and they forced him out of the car, made him strip naked, and forced him in the trunk of his vehicle. When Tony shut the trunk, she shut it on Joseph's hand, which broke all of his knuckles. She and Arky then hopped in the car and drove a few miles away to a rice paddy field. The paddy field was next to a hay field and it was separated by a barbed wire. Tony and Arky pulled his body over the frozen ground, dragged him over the barbed wire divider, which tore Joseph's skin off in different areas of his body. They were all now in the hay field and Joseph was kneeling next to the haystacks, freezing and begging for his life. He spent minutes pleading with Tony and Arky and talking about his family, and the only reason Tony allowed him to continue talking was because she had to load her gun. She knew in her heart that she was already going to kill him. When she finished loading her gun, she told Joseph to start praying, and before he was able to get a complete word out, Tony said she shot him right above his eye. Tony and Arky made no effort to hide the body and left his naked body in the open hayfield. They took $15 that was in Joseph's pocket, burned his clothes, and got in Joseph's car to head for the bank in Arkansas. While on their drive, Arky had second thoughts and said he wanted to rest and hit the bank another day. He did not realize what Tony was truly capable of, and in Tony's own words, Arky turned yellow and she knew he was having second thoughts, so angered by that, she hit him on the head with the butt of her gun. Now, with a change of plans, Tony and Arky split ways. Arky kept the car, and Tony took a bus to a brothel in Shreveport, Louisiana, where she used to work, because she thought she would be able to keep on the low there. Her aunt was a madam of the brothel, wanted no parts of what Tony was up to, and called her brother, who was Tony's uncle, to talk some sense into her. Her uncle George McQuiston, who also happened to be a Louisiana state trooper, was able to talk some sense into Tony by letting her know that there was no way she would be able to break her husband out of prison without living her life on the run and always looking over her shoulder. During this time, Joseph's body had been found and when Tony was questioned by Shreveport police, she confessed and let them know where she committed the crime. She was arrested, charged with murder, and was granted three trials. Her first trial lasted just two days. It was from March 27th to March 29th, 1940, and a jury found her and Arky guilty, and they were both sentenced to die by hanging. During that first trial, Tony put the blame all on Arky and testified that he was the one who actually killed Joseph. Arky did not know Tony was going to turn on him, so he was not prepared to testify. Tony appealed her sentence and was granted a new trial due to the fact that media was all over the case and she felt that the media attention gave the jury a preconceived notion of her, which ultimately sealed her fate in getting the death sentence. The second trial began the following year in February of 1941. For this trial, Arky finally testified against Tony, but nothing changed because they were again both sentenced to death. Her second appeal was granted for the same reason as the first, and the third trial began in January of 1942. She was again sentenced to death, and although she did try appealing a third time, 
The appeal was denied early November 1942, and her fate was sealed. If you remember, I mentioned that when she was first sentenced to death in 1940, the method was by hanging. But in the state of Louisiana in 1940, they changed their method of execution to electrocution by their infamous Gruesome Gertie, which was effective in June of 1941. So when Tony was sentenced again in 1942, the method was by electrocution. Tony was sent to Lake Charles Prison and agreed to many interviews. In her death row area, there was a dog she befriended and called her niece. She also became close to Father Wayne Richard, who was a Catholic priest and had converted Tony to the Catholic faith. He baptized her, but although it appeared that her beliefs changed while on death row, it did not seem to affect how she felt about the victim. Tony was quoted saying, I always knew there was a God running the show, but I thought I could steal just one little act. In the first place, the victim doesn't return to haunt me. I never think of him. I've known all along it would be my life for his. I believe mine is worth as much to me as his was to him. I wonder though sometimes why it's legal now for some fellow to kill me. On November 24th, 1942, Claude escaped from prison in an attempt to see his wife, Tony before her execution, but he was captured and was not able to see her. Four days later though, on Tony's execution day and before being taken out of her cell for her execution, the warden allowed her to have a final call with Claude. After her call, when she learned that her treasured hair had to be shaved off, she began to cry. She was then taken to a section of the Lake Charles Parish Jail where the traveling electric chair was set up. Tony showed more emotion for her hair than she ever did while on death row and being strapped in for her execution. She requested if she could wear a shawl to cover her bald head and the warden agreed. When she walked into the execution room, she was wearing a sheer red shawl. Deputy Sheriff Kenny Reed read Tony's death warrant and asked if she had any final words, and she replied by saying, I think not. She made no final statements, but when the executioner said, Goodbye, Tony Joe, she whispered a soft thank you, which were her last words. In the execution room was Father Wayne Richard, and Tony smiled for the reporters and witnesses. She prayed to herself for a bit, and the executioner then placed the death mask over her face and the execution began. She was pronounced dead at 12.12 12 p.m. and Father Richard officiated her funeral at the Lake Charles Cemetery. No family members claimed Tony's body, but Father Wayne honored Tony's last request of a crucifix being placed in her left hand with her so she could be buried with it. To date, she was the first and only woman to be sentenced to death by the method of electrocution and die by that method in the state of Louisiana. 26-year-old Arky was electrocuted in the same electric chair four months later on March 23, 1943. As for Tony's husband, Claude, he grew physically sick in prison after the death of Tony, and he was granted a hardship parole in 1945. He returned to his old ways of getting drunk and fighting in bars, though. Unfortunately for him, his prize-fighting style and bar fight wins came to an end when he chose to get into a fight with an armed bar owner who ended up shooting Claude in self-defense and killing him. The owner was never convicted or tried because of the witnesses at the bar confirming everything the owner had claimed. My thoughts and questions for you. There are people in this world who kill and think exactly like Tony did. She said she knew when she killed, it meant her life would be taken also. Some people don't fear death and could not care less about taking someone's life. I've told stories of people who kill while being locked up, so life in prison for them has not changed their perception or mindset. How is it fair that they can be so cold and calculated, have no remorse for killing, yet fight so hard for their life to be spared? She said she knew her life would be taken also, but based off of her many appeals and statements, she was against dying and felt that her life was just as valuable as the man she killed. Do you think it was fair that Arky received the same sentence as Tony even though killing was not his intention? 
Do you think it's fair for prisoners to get hardship paroles when someone in their family dies and they are murderers? Not only that, Tony and Claude had only known each other for a few months before they married. 